What's up, biology students? It's your benevolent biology teacher here. In today's video, we're going to talk about several examples of what happens when cell division goes horribly, horribly wrong. All cells come from other cells, and the cell cycle is like the life cycle of one particular cell. It ends, in most cases, with mitosis and cytokinesis. During mitosis, the contents of the cell's nucleus, 23 pairs of replicated homologous chromosomes, are systematically divided up into two new nuclei, each containing 23 pairs of unreplicated homologous chromosomes. Cytokinesis is the division of the cell's cytoplasm and is how one parent cell splits into two daughter cells. Each daughter cell inherits one of the new nuclei produced during mitosis, thus inheriting a set of genes that is virtually identical to the genes contained inside the original parent cell. It is all very orderly, at least it's supposed to be, but what happens when it goes wrong? You may recall from one of our previous videos that several related protein molecules called cyclins are responsible for regulating the timing and events of the cell cycle. When certain kinds of mutations occur in the genes responsible for cyclin production, the mechanisms that regulate the cell cycle may be disrupted, causing uncontrolled cell division, the effects of which can be disastrous. Uncontrolled, unregulated cell division is called cancer and cancers of various kind are a leading cause of mortality in adults. Cancer is caused by defective genes that fail to stop cell division, so that cells just keep dividing without end. This is a much messier process than normal cell division, and the cells undergoing uncontrolled growth clump together in growing masses called tumors. This lump of blue, disorganized cells in this figure is a tumor, and sometimes when tumors get big enough, cells may be dislodged from the mass and enter the bloodstream, which can carry the cancerous cells to other parts of the body, spreading the cancer. This is called metastasis, and metastatic cancers are very difficult to treat because you can never be sure where new cancerous cells may appear in the body. In fact, the only way currently known to cure cancer is to remove the defective cells from the body, either through surgery or with something like radiation or chemotherapy treatments. Here we see some microscope photos of normal and cancerous cells side by side, in the prostate, kidneys, and pancreas. You should notice that in all cases, the cancerous cells stain darker and appear far more irregular and disorganized than the normal cells. Cancers, if left untreated, will cause death. Because cancers are caused by faulty genes, if these faulty genes are present in reproductive cells, they may be passed on to the next generation, making it more likely that the offspring will develop cancer in their lifetime. Remember though, we have two copies of every gene, because we have two copies of every chromosome, and you would need two defective genes in order for regulated cell division to fail, causing cancer. But, inheriting one copy of a faulty cyclin gene makes the possibility of developing cancer greater because all it takes is one unfortunate mutation to disrupt the cell cycle and to cause those cells to start dividing uncontrollably. People who do not inherit any faulty cyclin genes would therefore need two unfortunate mutations to disrupt the cell cycle and cause cancer, and that's far less likely. So, anyone can get cancer, and the older you get, the greater your chances are of developing cancer. But genetics can make a person predisposed to certain types of cancer, which is why certain types of cancer seem to run in families. So, if you know that you have a family history of cancer, you should take extra precautions in order to decrease your personal likelihood of developing the disease yourself. In this graph, we can see the most common causes of cancer. At the top of the list are poor nutrition, physical inactivity, and obesity, smoking tobacco, and genetics. That's why the Surgeon General puts a warning on every tobacco product to notify the public about the possible consequences of smoking. But genetics and environmental influences beyond our control play a role as well. But genetics, as well as environmental influences beyond our control, play a role as well. Exposure to radiation and things like asbestos can cause mutations, mutations that may, if they occur in the right area of our DNA, cause cancer. It is important to note that even more than genetics, Personal health and fitness choices have a big impact on our likelihood of developing cancer. We can choose to eat poorly or to eat well. We can choose to be inactive or to exercise. And we can choose to smoke or not to smoke. And our choices in these areas may ultimately determine whether or not we develop cancer in our lifetimes. In these graphs, we can see the percentage of cancers of several varieties that are and are not attributed to smoking cigarettes. 
The whole bar, both black and blue parts, represents the number of deaths between 2000 and 2004 due to a specific variety of cancer. Lung cancer, for example, or pancreatic cancer, or esophageal cancer. The black part of each bar represents the number of deaths attributed to cancers caused by smoking cigarettes. For example, between the years 2000 and 2004, there were approximately 90,000 deaths from lung cancer in the male population of the United States, and almost 80,000 of those were attributed to cigarette smoking. Among females, over the same span of years, there were approximately 70,000 deaths due to lung cancer in the United States, and almost 50,000 of those were attributed to smoking cigarettes. The percentages are not always so high. A relatively small number of pancreatic cancers were attributed to smoking, for example. But for cancers of the lungs, mouth, and throat, smoking cigarettes is a huge risk factor. Fortunately, as we can see in this graph, the number of people who smoke tobacco in the United States is on the decline, and has been since the 1970s. As a result, the number of cases of lung cancer in males and females is also starting to drop. It is also important to note that it is never too late to quit smoking. This graph shows the likelihood of developing lung cancer with age. The red line represents people who continue to smoke for their entire life, whereas the dark blue line represents people who stopped smoking at age 60, and the light blue line represents people who quit at age 50. If we continue down, we see the line for people who quit smoking at 40, then at 20, and finally for people who never smoked. As you can see, not everyone who smokes gets lung cancer, and not everyone who avoids smoking avoids getting lung cancer. But the longer you smoke, the more likely it is that you will develop lung cancer. And the sooner you quit, the better your chances will be of avoiding it. But it's not as though you will ever reach a point where you can really say, well, I've smoked so much that I might as well just keep on smoking, because quitting always improves your odds, no matter how long you've been doing it. But cancer isn't the only thing that can happen when cell division goes wrong. A variety of chromosomal abnormalities can occur as well, especially if chromosomes don't get divided up properly during either mitosis or meiosis. Here we see two human karyotypes in which this sort of thing has occurred. One in which our individual, a female, has only one X chromosome instead of the usual two. And another in which our individual, a male, has three copies of chromosome 21 instead of the usual two. These are called numerical chromosomal abnormalities because it results in an abnormal number of chromosomes. This occurs because of something called non-disjunction, which is when chromosomes fail to separate properly during mitosis or meiosis. This is usually more serious when it occurs during meiosis, since the cells produced by meiosis are used for reproduction and could pass this kind of numerical chromosomal abnormality on to the next generation. But if it happens during mitosis very early in life, during embryo development for example, it can also be very serious because it will be passed to many, if not all, of the cells in the mature body of that organism. This figure shows all the different ways that non-disjunction can occur. In this first part of our figure, we see an example of non-disjunction occurring during meiosis 1, the first half of the meiotic process. In this case, homologous chromosomes fail to separate during metaphase 1 so that one new cell gets both homologous chromosomes and the other gets none. By the end of meiosis, this means that two of the four cells produced contain zero copies of this particular chromosome, and the other two cells contain two copies of this chromosome. Since these are gametes, they should have exactly one copy of every chromosome, not two copies and not zero copies. When non-disjunction occurs during meiosis 2, like we see here in this part of our figure, sister chromatids fail to separate properly during the second half of the meiotic process. Since this occurs later, in the second half of meiosis, after one round of division has already occurred, this means that two cells produced will still be normal, containing one copy of each chromosome. The other two cells, however, will be abnormal. One will contain two copies of this particular chromosome, and the other will contain none. This is essentially the same as non-disjunction that occurs during mitosis. Sister chromatids fail to separate properly, and one daughter cell inherits both sister chromatids from the duplicated chromosome, while the other cell inherits no chromatids from that chromosome. Instead of having two copies of each chromosome, one daughter cell will contain an extra third copy of a particular chromosome, and the other daughter cell will contain only one lone copy of this particular chromosome. 
more rounds of cell division will pass this abnormality on to other cells in the body. The end result of non-disjunction is either a monosomy or a trisomy. A monosomy is when cells contain only one copy of a chromosome, when they should have two. And a trisomy is when cells contain three copies of a chromosome instead of the usual two copies. Here we can see that after fertilization, the resulting zygotes have an abnormal number of chromosomes. In the case of these examples, zygotes inherited one copy of a chromosome from one parent and two copies from the other parent. This is a trisomy because this individual has three copies of this particular chromosome instead of two. In these examples, we can see that the zygotes inherited one copy of a chromosome from one parent and zero copies from the other parent. This is a monosomy because the individual has only one copy of this particular chromosome instead of the usual two. And here we can see what should have happened. One copy of this particular chromosome inherited from each parent for a total of two copies of this particular chromosome. The effects of these kinds of chromosomal abnormalities depend on which chromosome was affected by non-disjunction. But the effects are fairly serious in almost all cases. Remember, chromosomes contain hundreds, even thousands of genes. So when one is missing, or when an extra one is present, that's a big change in the information content of the cell. A pretty common example of a chromosomal abnormality is trisomy 21, in which an individual inherits three copies of chromosome number 21. This causes a condition known as Down syndrome, which usually isn't fatal, but which does have a very big impact on a person's life, physically, emotionally, and mentally. People with Down syndrome have delayed mental development compared to their peers, and are often unable to live fully independently as adults, having some level of personal assistance for their whole lives. But people with Down syndrome are also usually able to attend school, are usually able to have friends and interact with people, are able to perform basic tasks, and are sometimes able to hold down simple jobs in adulthood. People with Down syndrome often have vision and or hearing disorders and are at high risk for congenital heart disease. Many people with Down syndrome are also unable to have children themselves because they suffer from infertility. Edwards syndrome is another example of a condition caused by a chromosomal abnormality. In this case, an extra copy of chromosome 18. Most individuals with Edwards syndrome die before birth, and this particular condition has a very low survival rate overall due to the presence of serious heart defects that often occur as a result of this chromosomal abnormality. Other symptoms include smaller than average head size, webbing in some of the toes, and a cleft lip or palate. Individuals with Edwards syndrome also experience severely delayed mental and physical development and usually die sometime in the first year of life, but may live as long as 10 in some cases in which the symptoms are not as severe. Even more serious is Patau syndrome, a condition caused by an extra copy of chromosome 13. This condition is usually fatal before birth, and 80% of children born with Patau syndrome die in their first year of life and living beyond three or four is extremely rare. That's because Patau syndrome causes a wide variety of complex organ defects in the heart, kidneys, and genital structures. Individuals with Patau syndrome may have extra fingers and toes and may develop with only one eye socket. It is, ex it is a very extreme condition, and no one with Patau syndrome lives to reach adulthood. You may notice that these chromosomes in these karyotypes are sorted according to size. The lower the number, the bigger the chromosome, and the more genes that are carried on that chromosome as a result. Chromosomal abnormalities that occur in the bigger chromosomes, the lower numbers, are more serious because more genes are affected. Trisomy 21, or Down syndrome, is relatively mild compared to the effects of trisomy 13, or Patau syndrome, and that's because chromosome 21 contains far fewer genes than chromosome 13, so the impact is a lot less. It's still a big impact, but not nearly on the scale of uh, what we see with trisomy 13 and Patau syndrome. Let's take a look at a few more examples, this time involving these sex chromosomes. Kleinfelter syndrome, for example, occurs when a male inherits two X chromosomes in addition to their one Y chromosome. So, they are XXY males. The effects of Kleinfelter syndrome are relatively mild compared to the other syndromes we've talked about but they do include underdevelopment of the testes and sterility as a result. Males with Kleinfelter syndrome may develop breasts during puberty and often have less muscle mass than other males, but this condition is not fatal, 
and males with Kleinfelters are able to live very normal lives for the most part, even if they cannot have children on their own. Turner syndrome occurs in females, and happens when a girl has only one copy of the X chromosome, instead of the usual two. Like males with Kleinfelter syndrome, females with Turner syndrome usually have underdeveloped gonads and suffer from sterility and an inability to bear children as a result. Girls with Turner syndrome are also usually short in stature, have broad flat chests, webbing around the neck, and may experience symptoms of hypothyroidism and occasionally heart defects. Turner syndrome is usually not fatal, and many people with this condition lead relatively normal lives even if they cannot bear children of their own. In addition to being passed on in strange numbers from time to time, the structure of a chromosome can also be altered, affecting the expression of genes on that chromosome. Here on this slide, we see a wide variety of structural abnormalities involving chromosomes, from ring chromosomes, to chromosomes with two centromeres, to chromosomes that have sections deleted or sections added. Sometimes sections even break off, flip around, and reattach facing direction. All of these kinds of structural changes can mean changes in the way that genes are expressed, if those genes are even still present anymore. This affects the phenotype of the organism in a wide variety of ways, too many to list here. But if you understand how genes affect our lives, you probably understand that changing our genes in this way is likely to have big consequences, and that these consequences are not very likely to be beneficial. So, cell division goes wrong occasionally, sometimes horribly wrong, and when it does go wrong, it can cause things like cancer or Patau syndrome. Understanding how these disorders occur is the first step in finding ways to fix them. And lucky for us, it does go right the vast majority of the time. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, and remember, you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need to until you feel like you understand the consequences of cell division gone awry.